we can open the, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 1. Probably not a common scripture. I oftentimes tend to stay away from Ezekiel because he uses a lot of figurative language. But... So here in Ezekiel chapter 1, we'll read verses 26 through 28 for our text. He's been describing these creatures, which to me seem like the cherubs, as based on their description. But then we see the, the throne and the glory of God described. Amen. Ezekiel 1, verse 26. Here, Ezekiel describing the vision he saw. He says, And above the throne that was over their heads, speaking of these creatures, was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above, above upon it. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward. I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about it. And the appearance of the bow that was, that was in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake. Amen. Well, here we see Ezekiel describing his vision, and I don't know that language, especially the English language, can fully describe the glory of God, but the best that we have here, we can see the description we have of the throne and of God's glory. Says I think the cherubim are the creatures spoken of here, mm -hmm. described in the previous verses. But they're interesting creatures if you study those out. Mm -hmm. But in verse 26, he says, "Above the firmament." If we go back to verse 22. We'll see what this firmament he's speaking of. It says, "In the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creatures was as the color of the terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads above." Now, I know some. Say this firmament is describing the universe, and then above that is the throne of God. And this terrible crystal here is not something to be fearful of, not what terrible means, but terrible means that it was so full of awe, so bright, and so Amen. dazzling, if you will, that it was almost an overwhelming sight to Ezekiel. This word crystal is. Every other time the scripture is used as ice or frost, so some theorize that this is the waters above the firmament that Genesis 1 7 talks about. But mm -hmm. Whatever this is, it's I think beyond man's reach, and above that is the throne of God. Mm -hmm. We turn over to Exodus 24, we'll look. Here a couple times as well as Revelation chapter 4, we see some very similar descriptions of the throne of God. Exodus 24 and verse 10. Here it says, and they, speaking of Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu, and so, and seventy of the elders of Israel, in verse nine, it says, and they saw the God of Israel. Not that they really saw Him in all His glory, but mm -hmm. and there was under His feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in His clearness. Here they saw some type of vision of God on His throne, and under mm -hmm. it, it says there was these sapphire stones, and it was. Clearness. Mm -hmm. That's what this terrible crystal pictures here that was below the throne. If you go over to Revelation, it's described again in Revelation chapter 4. So we'll come back to those both of these chapters again in a moment. But Revelation 4, verse number 6. Here he John have been describing the elders and 
He sees the throne of God as well. And verse 6 says, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. In, that, in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Amen. So here we see around the throne there's this, what's described as a sea of glass, just pure and clear. Mm -hmm. That's this terrible crystal, this firmament that's describing and back in our text. And it was, the throne sits upon this place. Now, I don't think that's a physical place that man can ascend to one day, but if you, as I've described before, we have the first heaven, which is our atmosphere of the earth, and the second heaven is what we call the outer space, and then mm -hmm. God dwells in the third heaven. Amen. As Paul said, he knew a man that was called up to the third heaven. Amen. Okay. And this is in that third heaven, wherever that may be, except I don't think man could ever physically go there, but we see the throne of God here in this place in verse, go back to our text in verse 26. And it says, and above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne and the appearance of a sapphire, or as the appearance of a sapphire stone. So here we see the throne of God and it's described as a, a sapphire stone. I don't really know the significance of, a, of the sapphire stone, but it is typically blue in color. That's how it gets its name. I don't know if it appeared to him as one solid sapphire stone. Oftentimes, the, the things of God, such as the New Jerusalem, are described in, with these ornate stones, such as mm -hmm. and pearls and whatnot. So here, the throne of God is described as as a sapphire stone. For any of y'all that want to study out it, this stone appears again in Ezekiel chapter ten. Right. Then it says, and upon the the likeness of the throne was the likeness as appearance of a man upon it. Well, this is God on his throne. Oh, some propose that it's Christ because it appeared as a man. But we know God is one, so whoever it is, it was God in some manifestation upon his throne. And I think that's very clear by the following verse, verse 27. He describes... There in verse 28, the glory of this person. Amen. I, I think back to verses such as Moses, when he wanted to see God in his glory, and when Isaiah saw the, just the train fill the temple. How much more blessed it will be when we get to behold God and all his glory on his throne. Amen. Amen. So verse 27, we'll go on here, it begins to describe really the glory of this, of the Lord here. And it says, And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within, or from it, excuse me, as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of the fire, and it had brightness round about. Amen. And here he says, he just appeared as his bright light, this consuming fire, if you will, which is how God is described in various scriptures. Hebrews 12, 29 says, Our God is a consuming fire. There's really a reference back to Deuteronomy 4, 24. We can go back to Exodus 24 again. We'll read verse 17 this time. Exodus 24, verse 17 says, you know, after they had saw some of the glory of God, it says, In the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. God, in his glory, always appears as this consuming or devouring mm -hmm. fire. <laughs> Brother Duke alluded to this a little bit in his message Friday. That when our works are judged before God, okay. it will be His consuming fire of glory that will consume Amen. the wood, the hay, and the stubble. Yeah. Going back to 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11 through 15. 
I'm glad you didn't misrepresent that text as some people do. Uh, I hear what it says the Christ of the foundation, what we build on there is either gold and silver and precious stones or wood, hay, and stubble. Mm -hmm. I hear a lot of people say that the foundation is the, the wood, hay, and stubble. But right. That was the incorrect in application of those verses. Right. Christ is our foundation. Anything else is, as you pointed out, sinking sand. Amen. But what we build on there is what makes a difference and what will be judged before God. In my opinion, it's his, when his glory is released, when we are before him in all of his glory, all that stuff doesn't matter will be burnt up. Amen. It will be consumed. I even wonder sometimes if the fire that Peter described in 2 Peter chapter 3, if that's just God in all his glory being revealed. Right. And it says the element shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works therein shall be burned up. Yes. Just God in his glory and purifying all that is unclean before Amen. Man. We'll go on to verse 28 here. It says, as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. That was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. I mean, it goes on to describe here this appearance. He says, as the bow that is in the cloud or the rainbow, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. Well, I wonder what he meant here, but if you, I'll give you a little bit of a physics lesson today. Uh, pure white light, which describes God, which is often likened unto God. When you shine it through a triangular prism, you get all the colors of the rainbow. He lands. It cracks into all different colors. Really, his appearance is so pure that he would appear as a rainbow. He lands. Well, that. I think just adds even more to the blessing of the covenant that we have in the rainbow in the sky. That it's just a small glimpse of the glory of God. We can turn over to Revelation 4 and we'll see this rainbow mentioned again. Revelation 4 and verse 3, we're going to read verse 2 as well. Immediately after John was caught up into heaven, it says, And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that, felt, he that was set was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, and the sight like unto an emerald. <laughs> and here, no doubt, we see. Ezekiel and John saw the same throne of God. Mm -hmm. This, as he describes this rainbow, his bow, that his appearance was so pure, that's what it appeared as. There was not any darkness in the Lord. In fact, first John says, he is light and him is no darkness at all. Not even the slightest bit of darkness, but he is pure light. Mm -hmm. And if we go over to Revelation 21, verse 23, that he, describing the new Jerusalem, it says that there is no need of the sun, for he shall be the light of it. He is so bright and so pure that there will be no need for a sun anymore, but he will light the city there. Amen. When Moses wanted to see the glory of God, we know he couldn't because he would be consumed. Amen. It's because that God, our God, is just consuming fire, so pure that any evil will be consumed immediately. But here it says, "This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God, or excuse me, the glory of the Lord." So here Ezekiel got some little taste, if you will, of the glory of God. Would even this, I don't know, fully describes how great it will be to behold in person. Amen. Amen. 
And we see his response at the end of verse 28. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face. Mm -hmm. When reverence and humility he fell upon his face before God, which is like John when he saw the manifestation of Christ yeah. in Revelation 1 17, and he said, I fell at his feet as dead. Mm -hmm. Or we can go back to Revelation 4 one more time. Revelation 4, verse 10 and 11, we see these four and twenty elders around the throne. And notice their actions here. Revelation 4, verses 10 and 11 say, The four and twenty elders fell down before him that sat on the throne, and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the Lord, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Amen. Yeah. When, we get, when we stand before God in all his glory, I don't think we'll be too worried about mama or daddy anymore. Amen. Amen, brother. Rather, we'll just simply fall down and worship him, just as Ezekiel did, just as these elders did here. Hallelujah. Just thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things that thy pleasure they are and were created. But, we realize it's not for our pleasure, it wasn't not for our glory, but simply that we might bring glory to him for all of eternity. Amen. We might worship and praise him. That will be our response when we stand before him and all his glory. But for those that don't know Christ, it will be a much more miserable time. Won't it? Mm -hmm. They shall be cast from his presence for all of eternity. I know some may disagree with me, but I do believe that their punishment will be separation from God. Uh -huh. In fact, the scripture describes that punishment as outer darkness. Mm -hmm. With God, there is no darkness. So the outer darkness is a complete separation from God and all his glory. Mm -hmm. Although for us that have been born again, for us that are saved, it will be eternal glory for us. Then we will really truly realize what Paul was saying in Romans 8 when he said, I reckon that the sufferings of this life are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in the Amen. Amen. I don't know that we can fully grasp what it will be like in this finite line of ours, but one day we'll see this full glory of God on display. And Amen. And what's the privilege it will be for the child of God. Mm -hmm. But here we see Ezekiel's description of how that he is pure light, how he is a consuming fire, how he sits upon his throne. And one day we'll see that throne in person. Amen. I just pray that you know Christ as Savior when you stand before it. Amen, brother. I know, as Brother Duke mentioned, now, mentioned there, we will all stand before him one day. Amen. The unsaved will be judged by the works and cast in the lake of fire, and the saved will be judged if we will we give an account for the things we've done in this life. Hmm. We won't be able to make excuses before God. But right. Rather, we will only be able to stand there in light of his glory and realize that we probably failed very miserably. Right. Yeah. Just to consider his glory and what it will be like is a really an overwhelming thought for the child of God that one day we'll behold that. Mm -hmm. We could, he could have just, you know, May us not go to hell, but instead he gave us so much more than that. Amen, bro. But I said this vision here that Ezekiel saw, I'm sure it was a, a sight to behold in his day. Oh, what a blessing it will be when we get to behold it in person. Mm -hmm. but we have this description as well as the other one we mentioned is. Or excuse me, in Exodus as well as Revelation, they describe God and His throne and His glory. 
And sometimes we don't think very often on that. That heaven, as I've taught before, is not going to be about the things we like or things we enjoy. It's going to be about simply praising God and worshiping Him for all of eternity. Amen. Said I know. Perhaps we'll be able to speak with our loved ones that have gone on, or perhaps we'll be able to speak with those such as Paul and Jonas and others of the faith. But I think our primary concern will be. The Worship and praise of God. Amen. Let's. I just want to read this and then close in Revelation. Familiar passage in verse chapter twenty. Same place as the Duke read from. When we see the appearance of the throne again. Revelation twenty verse eleven through fifteen says, "And I saw." The great white throne, him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was not found, or, and there was found no place for them. And I mm -hmm. saw all the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. Hey. Death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. That's it. <coughs> well, I don't desire any of you here to stand before God at this time. But I pray that you will stand before and be able to behold all his glory for all of eternity. And we don't know. Christ is your Savior. If you never truly believed on Him, this will be how you behold Him. Mm -hmm. And then to be cast away from Him, as He says in mm. Matthew chapter 24, I believe, depart from me, you work as a new for I never knew you. Mm -hmm. You will get to see a glimpse of God, but it will not be that glorious glimpse that the child of God gets to see. Amen. Well, I pray that you believe on Him today. Let's close with that thought.